uh, come on in. I've got chairs here. I don't bite, and I also don't play Gallagher. Throwing watermelons. You've got to be old enough to understand that. Oh, I didn't say that, did I? <laughs> all right. It's all yours, my dear. Thank you. You're a, oh, I'm sorry. I should have introduced you. Good oh, evening, okay. Jim. How are you tonight? Tell us about the young man who gave the ultimate sacrifice for the First World War. There's some more seats under cover if you want to sit under the... And this is why I put plastic on my stuff. <laughs> and I don't know where this is coming from. Anyway, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the problem, about that in a minute, so what's going on. Um, good evening, my name is Jim Munford, and I am the president of Friends of Fairview. And um, I want to welcome you tonight. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our First World War and a soldier who's from New Albany who died in the campaign over there gave the ultimate sacrifice for his, you know, for our country. And he's getting, and another guy getting out of the rain. Where'd this rain come from? I it, yeah. yeah, I know. <laughs> um, but there again, let's, let's get right in it. We don't want to talk about what caused First World War. We can argue all night on that. 1914, though, is kind of a time in which they talk about is when the Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated in Bosnia. Then in 1915, we have the Lusitania being sunk by, we only had 100 and I think 28 people on that. We weren't excited about that too much, even though we had, we had arms loaded on that thing illegally, maybe. Um, but the main thing was, like any time, the domestic opposition to the war was immense. The American public did not want to go into a war that had not directly affected them whatsoever. Um, it just, they didn't want to do it. Had, life had, we haven't changed. Then we started sink, getting our supply ships that we were sending to um, England. Um, they were sent by German U-boats, and so now we affected us a little bit more. But then, of course, I think the straw that broke the camel's back was the Zimmerman letter and this will do a little history for some of you. It basically was Germany had contacted Mexico and said, hey, if you join us, let's put a base or two, you know, in Mexico, we'll give you back Texas after we win the war. We'll give you back California. Mexico said, yes, but we intercepted the letter. April 6, 1917, we declared war in Germany. That was it. After some of our oops and stumbles and everything, we got into the very first um, um, involvement was the Muse Argonne Offensive, which was known as the 100 Days Offensive, September 1918. And it, here we are in 1918. War's been going on since 14, kind of, 14, 15. But it was the largest and the bloodiest that took place in World War I. Let's talk about Private Miller, our subject. Right here, I'm getting pretty good at pointing the back ones here. Lawrence, Private Lawrence Raymond Miller. He was the son of Charles Ransom and Maddie Zershmead Miller. Born July 29, 1897, per the 1900 census and the Veterans Administration Master Index. He was the oldest of six children. And for those of you who live in New Albany, he lived, they lived on Slate Run Road just around the curve from B. Herald Avenue where it intersects there. He enlisted in 1917 and ended up being sent to Fort Omaha, Nebraska. What's, what's about Omaha? Besides, and what well, football player used to holler, Omaha, didn't he? Anyway, uh, 1907, the Army had built a large steel hangar there with the idea of experimenting with balloons, dirigibles, or airships. Shortly after the war started, 800 men volunteered almost immediately to be involved in this. Before the war was over, 16,000 had gone through the balloon school. But I got a feeling there weren't enough balloons to go around, and then the war got over quick. It was pretty quick after that. They didn't make it overseas. Private Miller was assigned eventually to the 9th Balloon Company in Virginia, in which he then shipped out of there. And I'll come back to that in a minute. 
by 1900 balloons they weren't like our birthday balloons they had cameras telegraphs and the idea was for observation to see what was going on around them um, but they were balloons they weren't airships or dirigibles they didn't have a rigid frame like the Hindenburg and we know what happened to Hindenburg in 1937 boom and why because it was full of hydrogen not helium the point being there is that helium had been discovered in America in 1903 we held 97-98% of the world's supply of helium were we going to give it to someone like our enemy nope not at all we weren't going to do it so we had the corner on helium now how much we used in world war one I, I really haven't heard much about that but it happened i'm sure during world war one though now let's get back to talking about that we'd send one or two people up in this balloon 500 4, feet in the air and on a clear day you see 40 miles that was a good help they didn't have drones they didn't have satellites and they didn't stand on no ladder to see very far. The idea was to spot the enemy, see where his artillery was at, see where his stuff was at. Artillery had gotten to the point where if they knew where they were shooting, they could drop their shell about anywhere. But the guy up in the balloon would get on his phone and holler down saying, Joe, two degrees up and you'll get him. And that's what it was all about. It was to help the artillery. Now, guess what? Balloons became a target. If we had a balloon go up a mile away from here, we could see it. Just, it would be easy to see. So, what would that be if we were the if we were the enemy? What would happen? We'd shoot at it. We'd try to shoot it down. And guess what? They went boom sometimes. So it was dangerous. So we guarded them, they guarded theirs, with anti-aircraft guns, machine guns, and fighter aircraft. And if you were a real gutsy aircraft pilot, felt like a stock car driver, you would take a chance and go after it and try to shoot it. Now, what happens when the balloon catches fire? And that's what happens. Now that's where I told, I told some of the group Herr Howard from New Albany could probably read that. I can't. It's in German. But you had to get out of that balloon and you didn't shimmy down the wire. It just didn't work. So they were the first group to use parachutes. Hmm. But all they were were a, was a harness around you and the parachute was actually in a bag outside the gondola. So you jumped out hoping you had clipped it to the parachute. As a rule, there was no issues. Now, since we didn't have drones and satellites, these were the things to have. And as you can see, the, Ameri the, the American and the Allied and the Germans looked relatively the same. But hydrogen was the key, was a big key for them. Now, let's jump back to Mr. Private Miller. He was shipped overseas from Virginia, June 30th, 1918, from Newport News, Virginia. There were 2,400 soldiers piled on that transport. I'm sure restroom facilities were not done. There's his orders, there's his name, and there's a list of who all was on the ship, what groups were on it. By the time he reached Europe in the front lines, poison gas. First, it was tear gas early in the war, and that was an irritant. And then they went to 1915 to chlorine gas, which would dissolve your lung tissue, uh, weaken it terribly. Um, by 1917, they started using some mustard gas to mix in there, but that's just about as bad. It was probably cheaper to make than chlorine was, or easier to get. Um, how was it delivered? delivered by artillery shells. They would put it in the tips of their shells and they would fire it, it would hit and they'd go like a smoke bomb. Now 
right here is where we get into talking about the guy who I was talking about a while ago. It was raining a while ago. Do you trust the weatherman? How often do you not trust him? If your forecast was off and the wind was blowing the wrong direction, where did that gas go? Back in your face. And it happened. And it was something that caused problems because that gas hovered along the ground. It was heavier than air. It would go into the trenches. It would go into the hospitals, into the cots. And what if you were sleeping? You were on the ground most of the time. That last battle from September, the end of September to November was during the time in which Private Miller was, how should I say, um, injured. But why was that such a big deal at that time? Germany was about ready to lose the war because we had entered it. The issue was something happened in 1917 in Russia, some kind of revolution. All of those German soldiers who were on that Eastern Front came to the West and all was then not quiet on the Western Front. At the time, Private Miller was injured. He was asleep on the ground. He received treatment. A couple of weeks, he came back. He wanted to come back to the war. He was ready to go. Suffered an attack of emphysema because what was going on about that time, 1918, 1919, the famous Spanish flu that we took over there with us became apparent that his lungs were affected and they sent him home. Now, all of us who remember the time we went through with COVID, <clears throat> that's what happened. Your lungs were just bad shape, you catch the flu and that was it on some people. His parents were notified when he got home in New York. They were with him, but on April 11th, 1919, he passed away in New York City with his mother at his side. She accompanied his body back here to New Albany. His sister Mabel was on her way there when she was stopped in Columbus, Ohio and turned around and came home. He was 21, young. Buried in Fairview Cemetery. He's buried in Platte 13, Rain 17. Up in the front part of the cemetery, along with the other two others of the group. Uh, a fourth one is over here somewhere, but you'll hear about him in a few minutes. But on a stone, it's marked, he's the hero of the Argonne. And there's a torch over there that you'll be able to see it like, like this. Now, school's not out yet, folks. We got a quiz. <sighs> this is a tough quiz. What American soldier won the Medal of Honor in the same battle? Within 100 miles. Sergeant York. Sergeant York. Yes. Sergeant York. Now, that was quick. But now, there's a second one. Second American that was badly wounded right there. But he was machine gunned. He was shot up and about killed him. Now, here's your hints now. Tank commander. George C. Scott. Um, Pat. Mm. Lieutenant Colonel George S. Patton was right there, the same 100 mile area, matter of fact, that may have been less than 100 miles, of where all this took place. So I'm done, and I want to thank you. They're not on top of us. If anyone's got a question, have at it, and then I'll sign it to her. No. <laughs> no. Well, Jim, thank you very much for telling us about um the information on the first world war and i have one thing i missed so i want your eyes to look that way that stone there is uh a akita rock itelka rock there we go yeah i really having it tonight anyhow she was born there are we really don't want to miss this stone because she was born april 12 1883 in new albany who had and her for school in 1912 she was employed at new albany high school she taught German and Latin and was the assistant principal. She retired in 1952 in New Albany. She died March 3rd, 1977. 
living in the same house her father built, 1811 Eakin Avenue, and it's still there. When you drive down Eakin Avenue, find 1811 and look at that house. Still there. I want to make sure we didn't miss that.